David Z. Kushner, Professor of Music Emeritus in the University of Florida School of Music. Professor uh, Kushner holds the degrees of Bachelor of Music from Boston University, a Master of Music from the College Conservatory of Music in the University of Cincinnati, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. He has directed graduate seminars in American music, nationalism in music, music criticism, 19th century music, 20th century music, piano literature, chamber music literature, symphonic literature, and opera history, and continues to supervise doctoral dissertations. He is uh, the recipient of uh, many awards and uh, distinctions, uh, the MTNA's Master Teacher Certificate in Music History, the International Biographical Center's Award of Excellence, and the American Biographical Institute's Most Noted Speaker Award. He has lectured and performed throughout the United States and in Canada, Israel, Kenya, Australia, and Eastern and Western Europe. Dr. Kushner, who was the first president of the American Musicological Society Southern Chapter and a charter member and former president of the College Music Society Southern Chapter, is a co-founder and charter life member of the American List Society. He is the author of uh, uh, much too long a list of publications for me uh, to read. I suppose that for us in uh, this meeting, the two principal uh, books are Ernest Bloch, A Guide to Research, published in New York in 1988, and the Ernest Bloch Companion, published in 2002. His topic today is one that he has addressed in uh, earlier publications and of uh, extremely great importance for us, Ernest Bloch and the Jewish Question. Please welcome Dr. David C. Kushner. Thank you very much. As a young man on the threshold of a career, Ernest Bloch was forced by circumstances to confront his innermost beliefs about religion. In a letter to his parents, he writes as follows, quote, I am certainly not a believer, nor an atheist either. I find it as absurd to want to prove there is a God as to prove that there isn't. One will never know except that man is miserable, full of vanity, wicked and false, who reverts back to the beast when he is let free. The anarchists make an angel of him. No, I myself believe in a certain fatality, a harmony of the whole, which makes me accept all that happens, but which will not stop me from recriminating. That's why I am furious when I get upset at the past. What is, is, and was meant to be. To find out if God exists or not is not my business or anybody else's. In any case, if he exists, it isn't the fellow that religions portray. He must be great and impassive, like nature and her elements. I become pantheist, end of quote. The remainder of this two-part letter attempts to console his parents and asks them to accept their daughter's decision as to do otherwise would destroy her happiness. Bloch also offers other insights into his own thinking. Now, the reason that he was uh, concerned with this particular topic at this time was that when he expressed these views, these views, it was 8 of May, 1900. He was 19 years old at the time. It's in a letter to his parents, written in Frankfurt, where he was then studying with Ivan Knorr. The letter was prompted by the news that his sister, Lulette, five years his senior, was planning to have her baby girl baptized in the Calvinist faith. He continues in the letter, quote, you know for a long time that I admire deeply the doctrine of Christ and that I admire Jesus from the depth of my heart as being the only man who conformed and acted by his principles, the only one who practiced what he preached. And I affirm that nobody since he existed has truly followed his precepts. Nobody, absolutely nobody, 
and he who does not scrupulously carry out the acts of a doctrine cannot pretend to be an adherent of that doctrine. Therefore, in spite of the epithet Christian, nobody in the world is one. End of quote. After pursuing his studies further in Munich and in Paris, and witnessing the premiere in the latter city of his lyric drama, Macbeth, on 30 November 1910, and the resultant intrigues and cabals, the disillusioned musician returned to Geneva, where he worked in the family store selling tourist merchandise. He conducted orchestral concerts in Lausanne and Neufchatel, and resumed his discussion of Jewish concerns with Edmund Flegg, real name Flegenheimer. Flegg, a writer of poems, plays, and essays, provided the French texted libretto for Macbeth, as well as the French translations for the composer settings of Psalms 114, 137, and 22. As early as 1906, Bloch wrote a revelatory letter to his collaborator as follows. My dear friend, I have read the Bible. I have read fragments about Moses, and an immense sense of pride has been surging within me. My entire being reverberated. It is a revelation. I shall find myself again in this. I could not continue reading, for I was afraid. Yes, Flegg, I was afraid of discovering too much of myself, of feeling everything which had gradually accumulated, glued to me, fall away in one sudden blow, of finding myself naked again, naked within this entire past which lives inside me, of standing erect as a Jew, proudly Jewish, and of no longer being able to stand the conditions in which I live, end quote. To some extent, Bloch had come back to his roots. After all, his paternal grandfather, Isaac Joseph Bloch, was a Baal Tefila and a leader of the small Jewish community in Lenyau in mid-19th century. But following his bar mitzvah, he seems to have had little interest in the Jewish religion or culture. While many commentators have cited the reawakening of his heritage, it is instructive to note what became a lifelong ambivalence toward his religion. In the same year in which he penned the declaration of assertiveness regarding his Jewishness to Flegg, at the urging of his friend Robert Godet, 1866 to 1950, he bought a large wooden crucifix in the antiquarian shop of Bern, Switzerland. The latter, who had written favorably about the two movements of the composer's symphony in C-sharp minor that were performed in Basel in 1903, established a decade-long friendship with Bloch. In that same fateful year, 1906, Godet urged Bloch to express his Jewish lineage musically. Thus it was that the friendships with Flegg and Godet converged but from opposing directions, to create in Bloch a new awareness of his inner self. Bloch had wondered why Godet had been so insistent on the purchase of the Christ statue. Some years later, he received in the mail a book Godet had been translating into French, Euston Stuart Chamberlain's Die Grundlagen des Neunzehnhundert Jahrhunderts. That was published in 1899. Stunned by the book's content, and particular the theories regarding Aryan racial superiority and the negative attributes ascribed to Jews, Bloch, feeling as though he were serving as Godet's guinea pig to test Chamberlain's theses, severed all ties with his, quote, friend, end quote. The statue, which symbolized for Bloch, the suffering of all humanity, remained with him throughout his life. Bloch's flirtation with this admixture of Christological and Judaic theology and his fomenting a Blochian view of universalism in all matters reached the level of a fixation by the time Bloch had established himself in the United States. He is quoted in an interview with Cesar Sershinger 
as saying to a lady who had noted the apparent incongruity of the Christ statue in his New York apartment, quote, My dear madam, yes, it is true that I am a Jew, but I should be equally proud to call myself a Christian, for he is to me only the symbol of that Christianity which both Jew and Gentile strive to attain, who, indeed, will have the temerity to call himself Christian. End quote. And yet, on April 3, 1918, Lach attended services at an old Orthodox synagogue on the Lower East Side of New York in the company of Dr. and Mrs. Judah Magnus. In a letter to his mother, dated 5 April of that year, he reveals his deeply felt impressions of a group of some 50 Hasidim chanting the service in a Spartan room with well-worn tables and chairs. He also recalls the dinner that followed at the Rebbe's house and the warmth and sincerity of the relatives who visited on that memorable Sabbath. Locke's letter is instructive, too. In it, he informs his mother that the service was for, quote, the last days of Easter, end quote, and that he remembered his Hebrew name, Yitzrak Sik Ben Meyer, end quote. At the close of this letter, the composer expresses his joy at expressing a vital part of his roots and hope, quote, to go often to submerge myself there if they are willing to accept me. It is another world which can help me to support the one in which we have to live every day, end quote. As was so many times the case thereafter, the exuberance of the moment was just that, a fleeting fancy upon which he did not act. From the Cleveland Institute of Music, where he served as director 1920 to 25, he wrote to Flegg on, April, on May 30th of 1923 about his desire to compose a symbolic mass, a continuation of his symphony Israel, which would include Gregorian themes, Lutheran chorales, and motifs from his Jewish cycle. He expanded these thoughts in a letter to Ada Clement two years later, quote, The last movement conceived in 1914, and of which I have sketches, was meant to signify, quote, next year in Jerusalem, end quote, but in a symbolic sense the triumph of truth and justice and peace on earth. At the end of the bass, would come in front of the stage and proclaim a credo embodying my own idea of Judaism and of humanity. Quote, Here ends Israel, but here begins the realization of its ideals, which are those of all humanity, according to the great prophets proclaiming the unity of humanity, and a chorus would end with a hymn of peace and love. This mass, which would bring my excommunication from among the Jews, the Protestants, the Catholics, would be a tremendous thing. The text of the mass contains the whole philosophy of life. The Kyrie would embody all the sufferings of man since the beginning of the world. The struggles in the darkness, the appeals to God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then I could realize my whole philosophy of life and thought. Shall I ever be able to do it? I do not know. I am despairing. Voila, l'histoire d'Israël. End quote. When Bloch returned to Europe after five years as director of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, his first and most serious creative effort was the composition of the Avodah HaKodesh. It was this vehicle that forced him to confront his deepest feelings about religion in general and Judaism in particular. In intimate Hebrew expression, Aboda, written for the prodigy Yehudi Menuhin, who gave it its world premiere on 5 December 1928 in San Francisco's Exposition Auditorium, was a miniature prelude, perhaps, to the gigantic challenge that he now faced as a composer and as a Jew. 
As Bloch settled down in Rovereto Capriosca, in the small Italianate canton of Ticino, his first task was to undertake a study of the Hebrew language, a tongue that he barely recalled from his bar mitzvah preparation. Because cantor Reuben Rinder, who was to have helped him in this task, was indisposed owing to an accident, he was forced to accept this challenge as a personal one. As the sacred service was intended for the Reformed Temple Emmanuel in San Francisco, the text draws from the Davidic Psalms, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Isaiah, and Proverbs. The composer's fervor is expressed in a letter to Ada Clement and Lillian Hodgehead, quote, It far surpasses a Jewish service now. It has become a cosmic poem, a glorification of the laws of the universe. I intend, besides the service, to write a great orchestral choral work with it. I do not care any more what people will say. I do not wish it for the Jews, who will probably fight it. Not for the critics, not for the tradition. It has become a private affair between God and me." End quote. These words illustrate the hyperbolic flights that Bloch sometimes took when in the throes of high optimism or creative energy. They also reveal, yet again, the zigzag approach he had always taken toward religion. In the sacred service, the only music that derives explicitly from the Jewish service is the Tzur Yisrael. It is a more than passing interest to observe the artist's reference to Christian, specifically Roman Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic, musical and religious traditions when attempting to prefer analogies to the Jewish service. In his letter to Cantor Rinder on 26 November 1930, he points out that he sees HaKodesh Baruch Hu, the Lord be praised, as a, quote, kind of Jewish magnificat, end quote. He elaborates on this theme by stating that although the service's opening motif is herein employed, there is a relationship to the Gregorian Magnificat, quote, most probably originating in the synagogue in Jerusalem, and which I will restore to us, end quote. Later, in the same letter, he refers to the Kaddish as the doxology, while the texts of both center on the praise of God, the context is dramatically dissimilar. The Jewish prayer for the deceased is surely not commensurate, for example, with the Protestant, praise God from whom all blessings flow, or the Catholic, Gloria in excelsis, the greater doxology, or Gloria Patri, the lesser doxology. Liturgical practices in which the term doxology is applied. With respect to the final two stanzas of the closing hymn, Adon Alam, God of All, the composer tells the cantor that, quote, this is our Christianity, the God near man, and not in need of taking a human shape of being crucified, end quote. The explanation of the text rendered to Rinder is quite different from the one he offered to his audience at a lecture he gave at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music on 16 September 1933. On that occasion, before a general audience, he spoke about Adon Alam as follows, quote, Then the Christianity comes in, God's becoming more in the shape of a man. He is my God my living liberator, end quote. Albert Weiser construed this statement as affirmation that Bloch often made confusing and paradoxical statements about his religious convictions. It appears to this writer that the composer provided Cantor Rinder with the kind of Jewish perspective that he, Rinder, would welcome. Yet, to the general populace, he felt impelled to inject a Christological influence. Bloch's naivete regarding Judaism is matched by an equal naivete regarding the world's political realities in 1934. In New York, for the American premiere of the Sacred Service, 
He gave an interview in the New York Times in which he opined, quote, The phenomenon of Germany is bigger than the treatment of the Jews. A movement as profound as the Lutheran Reformation is taking place. I greatly respect Hitler's sincerity. He believes wholly and disinterestedly in what he is doing. He is a fanatic, if you will, on fire with his cause, but certainly not an opportunist making political capital. But to label him and his movement merely as anti-Jewish is inaccurate. The movement goes much further back. Its Jewish aspect is discernible in H.S. Chamberlain's Genesis of the 19th Century, end quote. Locke seems oblivious to the fact that only a year previous to these comments, the Nazi regime had passed laws enabling them to oust Jews from positions in government and cultural institutions. Either he suppressed knowledge of such events, or he was, for whatever reasons, unaware of them. As Bloch's words paint him as ambivalent and ambiguous about his Judaism, many commentators, composers, and performing musicians seem bent on pinning a Jewish label on him, although the means by which they did this vary in intent and in the degree to which they ascribe Bloch's faith in Judaism. Ernest Newman, for example, who saw the intended universality in the sacred service, nevertheless observes a conflict between the musician's heart and mind. This apparent paradox is seen in the settings of the Shema, wherein the augmented fourth, A to D sharp, concludes the text, O hear Israel, our God, our creator is one. Our God is one, end quote. Newman hears the tritone as a question rather than as a statement of conviction, but he seems not to hear the note of resolution, E. This type of accentuation and resolution appears in too many compositions by this composer to be regarded as signifying, as Newman would have it in this instance, that Bloch, quote, in his heart of hearts, had little belief in his own words of faith and hope, end quote. These words, of course, are not blocks, and the admitted questioning of faith can easily be found not in the intervallic choices of certain passages, but in the artist's own words. Paul Rosenfeld, a one-time champion of blocks music, found the sacred service, quote, appallingly tame, resembling a work one might have expected of an English Victorian, end quote. He skewers this cosmic poem as lacking religious conviction, but he takes a different path from Newman in arriving at this opinion. Rosenfeld cites as his proof for this assertion Locke's quotation of the reader's words prior to the mourner's cottage in the Union Prayer Book for Jewish Worship, quote, In the fullness of time, we shall know why we are tried, and why our love brings us sorrow as well as happiness, end quote. The critic erroneously speaks of these words as, quote, the little sermon interpolated by the composer, end quote, yet another example of attributing to Bloch something he did not say. It is quite possible, however, that he, Bloch, was thinking of this text on a personal level when he asked that it be sung, quote, with an expression of despair, end quote. Lazar Siminski agreed with Bloch that race was an important and influential factor in determining cultural identity, but that when it is used, as it was by the likes of Richard Wagner and H.S. Chamberlain, to malign others, it has exceeded its usefulness as a tool of understanding. With regard to the sacred service, Siminski takes a circuitous route to identify it as being essentially a Jewish expression. He concludes that because the six-note Gregorian motif on which it is based had its basis in Jewish biblical chant, the service has evolved from its original roots. 
Finding that the concert hall is too theatrical a setting for the work, he comments, quote, The synagogue will subdue the over-exuberant and the superficial quasi-tribal climaxes, will lend dignity and pathos of quality to the rendition. Then the full value of this important work will benefit Judaism, the synagogue, and our everyday cultural life, end quote. Kurt List also finds the sacred service, quote, a rather unique and unmistakably a Jewish work, end quote. He concludes that contrary to Bloch's intentions, he, Bloch, has rather, quote, created such a uniquely separatist and Jewish world that it becomes radically unassimilable for the Western world, end quote. When Bloch was asked by Samuel Laterman, a leader of the Chicago community, the Chicago Jewish community in Chicago, and a major figure in the Bloch Festival held in that city between 28 November and 3 December 1950 for his reaction to List's article, the composer commented caustically, quote, the best Jews were burned and tortured by Hitler, while some of the worst escaped and now poisoned America, end quote. While the lists of the world were apparently assimilated into mainstream America, others, such as Bloch, were caught in the dilemma of ambivalence and ambiguity. Leonard Bernstein, in his recording of the Sacred Service, makes significant alterations in the score, the result of which was to bring Bloch's universal approach to religion back to its Jewish moorings. The sections designated spoken voice, recitative-like passages with clearly marked pitches and rhythms, are instead recited as ordinary speech by Rabbi Judah Kahn. As this decision led to a shortening of the time normally required to recite the Alenu, much of the music is heard without voice, text, rehearsal numbers 67 to 72. When the rabbi resumes with the text immediately preceding the Kaddish, that is, and now ere we part, he again recites the text in ordinary speech, not as Bloch would have it in a recitative style. At this point, Bloch inserts the Tzur Yisrael. In concert hall performances, the Kaddish is not said, but as the score indicates in a temple setting, the rabbi could say Kaddish in Hebrew at this juncture, while the cantor and chorus are rendering Sur Yisrael. Suzanne Bloch was derisive in her comments on Bernstein's tampering with the score. Quote, A few months after my father's death, Leonard Bernstein chose to ignore the music written so carefully for this part, giving the explanation that the sung version written by Bloch would overshadow, quote, the marvelous orchestral part, end quote, and was, quote, too theatrical, end quote. This is what was recorded. I was told that my disapproval would have been disregarded as the soloist, Robert Merrill, would have refused to sing the very difficult part. At the time, I had not the guts to make a scene, which I now regret. This Lenny interpretation set a tradition by which the work is now regularly desecrated." End quote. Quite apart from the substitution of spoken words for the call for recitative style, Bernstein's inclusion of the Kaddish in both his public and recorded version of the work restored it to a Jewish imprint an idea clearly at odds with the intentions of both the composer and his daughter. It is important to note, however, that Bloch was again equivocal with regard to the Jewish versus universal message, for in the synagogue he is parochial, while on the public stage he moved toward a message he hoped would be acceptable to all people. End quote. Herbert Fromm, provides the most imaginative effort to plaint Bloch as a Jewish composer. 
To do so, he imbues the composer with a knowledge of Judaism that stretches the imagination. In what he calls, quote, an imaginary discourse preceding the playing of Ernest Bloch's sacred service, end quote, Fromm relates the opening motif to the tetragrammaton, the four unvowed Hebrew letters YHWH, which represents the unspeakable because of its sacredness, name of God. The seeming discrepancy between these four letters and the six notes of Bloch's motif is explained by the composer's opting for the transliteration of the Hebrew spelling Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -H, in order to account for the fact that the third and sixth letters are the same in transliteration, while in Bloch's motif, the second and fifth notes are identical, Fromm refers to the third of the Ten Commandments, quote, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Quote. As traditional Jews go of their way, go out of their way to avoid any possibility of violating this commandment, even to spelling God as G D, when using English, from in a massive leap of faith, adduces that Bloch's altering of the six note motif is the result of his wish to honor the third commandment. It was only appropriate when the composer was ill in a Portland hospital that he had a visitor who well understood the man's turn of mind. Jacob of Shalomov, conductor and musical director of the Portland Youth Philharmonic, reports on a touching scene, quote, I had two scores under my arm. His own work, Sweet Symphonique, and the Pange Lingua Mass by Jascan. I told him, quote, people are doubtless bringing you flowers, but I have something even more beautiful, end quote. Within minutes, we were singing the two-part Plainy Sunt Chaley in our cracked composer's voices, regardless of the nuisance it might be to neighboring patients, oblivious to an incongruity of two Jews singing an ancient Catholic mass in a Protestant hospital, just because we love the music, end quote. To be or not to be a Jew, that was the question with which Bloch wrestled his entire life. He wished to transcend Judaism and enter a type of universalism, and that was received in a paradoxical manner. His music, even when it is most Jewish, speaks to Jew and non-Jew alike. Bloch the man, however, is symbolized by the six-pointed Star of David, with the initials E.B. enclosed therein, that graces the cover of many of his works, including those without Jewish implications that were published by G. Shermer. He was, he is, and he will be a Jew despite himself. I'd like to show the cover of the Scherzo Fantasque with the Star of David at the top of it. And thank you, and good evening. Sorry, noon. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I think that I might be able to show the cover of that Scherzo Fantastique that was just alluded to. I'm not sure if you've all been able to see it. There we go. Is that visible to you all? Scherzo Fantastique, fantas excuse me. Fantastic, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Nothing uh, remotely Jewish about the content, and yet the uh, Star of David with the initials E, B in the middle. 